are, are sure that you have the answers and that you have, um, in some cases, documentation backing up what those answers are. Uh, the things I'm talking about are the ones that are bulleted here, uh, the proper parties. So in that case, that would, that would go both to individuals making sure that you have their accurate names. You know, in, in my case, my name is Jeff Baxter. You would probably want to have Jeffrey G. Baxter or Jeffrey Garth Baxter. That's my middle name. I can hear the laughter already. Um, if it's the name of an entity, you want to make sure that you have the proper entity name. Um, that includes not only making sure, you know, for instance, if you have someone that does business as, you know, uh, ABC Plumbing, but their actual entity is, you know, XYZ Inc., um, you want to make sure that you have the entity uh, itself, the XYZ Inc., as opposed to just the DBA name. Uh, that can also um, include uh, the punctuation. You know, there are different ways that you can abbreviate LLC. It could be LLC, no no spaces, no periods. It can be L period, L period, C period. It can be LC, it can be L period, C period. Making sure that your documentation includes the actual legal names of the entities is also important. Uh, that you have signatures for all the parties, that your notarization blocks are correct and fit within Iowa requirements. Um, that you get the documents notarized, that's a that's a key provision or a key element. Uh, you don't want to try to record a document that's not been notarized, otherwise the recorders are going to have uh, an issue with you. Um, making sure that your legal descriptions, that your collateral descriptions in your, in your financing statements uh, accurately describe the property that you're intending to get. Uh, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've seen the incorrect legal descriptions or just the cut and paste from the um, um, assessor's website trying to be passed off as a legal description. That's not a legal description. That's not one that you want to use. Uh, you'll want to, you know, find the actual legal description of the property to include in them and that make sure that all of your documents agree. Um, you know, as you're going through your documents, you'll oftentimes have defined terms. It, the best practice would be making sure that those defined terms are, are consistent throughout all your documents so that you're not referring to um, you know, borrowers in one case or debtors in the other documents, uh, making sure that your documents are consistent is, is, is a good practice to make sure that you um, have consistency throughout uh, your loan documents. Um, at this point, we're going to go ahead and get into some specific provisions that you want to make sure that you have in your loan documents. Uh, we'll start with some of the big ones, the homestead provisions. Um, Homestead protection uh, is granted um, uh, in in Iowa code. Uh, it uh, it prevents you from being able to um, um, foreclose on certain property in certain instances. And so, what you want to make sure that you have is um, the the requisite language to um, waive those protections and uh, allow you uh, the ability to um, to uh, act on the property that you've got. Um, Homestead applies to, it's, uh, this is under uh, Iowa Code Section 561. Um, it includes, well, it has to include a house. It, 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 in order to get protection from the homestead, it must include a house uh, that's used as a home by the owner itself. Um, if you have more than one home, you can designate an owner, can designate which property is protected. Um, the owner of the home can also include the beneficiaries of a trust, uh, so it isn't just individuals. It can also uh, be uh, held in a family trust and still uh, act as a homestead. Uh, the size limitations on homestead property is 40 acres or more of ag property, and if you're within a city plat, it's a half acre or less. Um, and the there are there are some there's a recent case actually uh, from I think January of 2017 that allowed for uh, some some tricky uh, platting to allow uh, or, to, or to provide homestead protection. In the particular case, uh, there was an acre parcel, a roughly acre parcel of land. Um, the homestead protection obviously only applies to a half acre. So what this uh, creative owner did is he had a, uh, a homestead plat created and recorded that basically outlined the property in a one foot parcel or a one foot uh, strip of land and then included the driveway and the the surrounding areas of the of the the 
real estate of the, the improvements on the property and called that his homestead plat. So the non-protected non-homestead plat included all of the side yards and the front yard and the rear yard of the property. And uh, the bank objected to that, saying that it, it violated zoning requirements and so it couldn't be protected as a homestead. And the court disagreed, saying that there is no the only requirement that is in the uh, uh, statute is that, uh, uh, that, that basically the, the homeowner can can provide a plat of any property they want um, um, as long as it's used as a as as used as the residence, used as a home by the owner. Um, and so in this case, uh, the the owner was able to kind of put one over on the bank. Um, so keep those kind of things in mind as you're as you're um, working through your documents and making sure that um, you've got these protections in place. Otherwise, they can come back and bite you. Um, you can have uh, um, uh, the homesteads are exempt from judicial sale where uh, there's no special declaration of statute uh, to the contrary. Um, in order to get the homestead protection, uh, there has to be a waiver of that language and that's specifically um, listed in statute. Uh, here, the, the contract or if you're, I'm sorry, let me back up. You can get a, an exemption of the uh, homestead can be waived uh, for ag land, specifically ag land, and that's anything greater than 40 acres. Anything less than 40 acres is what's um, um, in the, uh, the, the previous section. But if it's greater than 40 acres, the waiver is um, going to be required to be bold face type, 10 point font or larger. It's got to be signed and dated by the person waiving the exemption at the time of the execution of that document. Usually in your documents, you'll see this is where you have that extra signature line immediately following the, the waiver, um, in addition to the final signature line for binding the, the party to the document. Uh, it must also require specific language that's set in statute. Um, you, you likely, I would hope, have this in all of your documents, uh, but it'll look pretty familiar to you. Um, it is the it is the language that you'll want to make sure that you have and you want to make sure that you have it in there verbatim and it states that you understood that the, the party signing understands that the homestead property is in many cases protected from the claims of creditors and exempt from judicial sale and signing the contract they voluntarily give up their right to this protection for the property with respect to the claims based upon this contract um, if you don't have this language verbatim in your contract make sure you get it in there uh, if you don't have it you're going to run into problems with uh, with homestead issues uh, the next item uh, on our list is going to be uh, spouses. Um, you have to have the signature of spouses uh, in order to to um, uh, in order for your protection. Um, if the owners, well, realistically, one 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 point that I try to tell clients is to make sure that you know the marital status of all of your borrowers. Um, if you can get a representation from them as to that marital status. Uh, that'll help protect you if there is an issue down the line. Um, there are exceptions. A few years ago, there were not exceptions, and several banks got burned um, by not getting a signature from a spouse. Now, this, the, the legislature has recognized that issue, and they put in some extra language into the statute that would accept, um, um, that, would, that would not provide the protection for the spouse, that basically um, the spouses are not going to, to get a house for free um, if they're, I think the, the termination by divorce has always been in there and uh, the encumbrance by a, a purchase money loan is new. Uh, but here a court sitting in equity determines that invalidating the conveyance would unjustly enrich the non-signing spouse. That will probably protect you in most instances, but best practices, make sure that you have your, your um, spouses or, or make sure that you have your borrowers correctly identified as being married or single or uh, I guess those are the only two things. Um, but getting those, I getting those, <laughs> there's a couple minutes. yeah, I don't know. Maybe we'll come up with something new here uh, soon. Um, but those are, those are going to be your, your, uh, your protections for, for spousal interests in the homestead. Um, the next item that we're going to talk about is purchase money priority. Um, now, 
if you have a purchase money loan, you're going to get priority over pre-existing judgments of the purchasers. Um, this is important in case you have a borrower that uh, has some stuff that's outstanding, some some outstanding judgment liens. Um, this this will protect you. You're going to need to have a reference in your document that the doc, that the mortgage or that the loan is is uh, purchase money. The mortgage is purchase money or protecting a purchase money loan. Uh, there isn't any specific statutory language to that effect. Um, it can just simply say that it's a purchase money mortgage. Uh, it's not like the dragnet provision that uh, Iowa law has regarding maximal uh, maximum credit uh, available to the borrower, where you have specific language here. Uh, it doesn't have to have um, that kind of statutory language. Uh, it can be uh, just a reference to that. Uh, but you're going to want to make sure that you have that in there. Otherwise, you're going to uh, run into problems with priority over any judgments that uh, the borrower may have, um, which you don't want. Uh, next item is this is, this is more if for, for loans that deal with personal property. Um, if you have collateral, uh, that includes personal property. Uh, you have to have a security agreement in order to attach that security interest. Um, you know, in order to perfect a security interest in in loans, you have to have a security agreement. You have to have a proper description of the collateral, um, and then it has to um, uh, be perfected in whatever form is required for the type of assets that you've got. Um, but you have to have a security agreement. That's your first step in protecting yourself uh, uh, when you have collateral that is personal property. Now, the security agreement doesn't have to be a separate document. Oftentimes it is because you want additional um, language spelling out your rights as the secured creditor. Uh, or, you know, uh, there's a lot of reasons to have a separate security interest, but it's not essentially required in order to get yourself that protection. Um, all it really simply has to say is that it's a it's a security agreement uh, as defined in the it doesn't it just really has to say that it's a security agreement and it protects your interest. This is some sample language that if you don't have a separate security uh, agreement, you, you may want to contemplate including this language in your loan documents because this should suffice uh, in most instances. Um, really, all you're going to want to make sure that you do is adequately describe the property. Uh, and depending on what that property is, there's there's different ways that you can do that. But uh, enough that will will put uh, other creditors on notice that you have the security interest in the property is kind of the essential element that you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> the next um, few items that we're going to start looking into are loan terms that you may not have in your loan documents necessarily. Uh, if you use Laser Pro or Encompass or uh, Walters Cluey or any of the other um, uh, loan document software suites, uh, you may not have these specific provisions in your documents. And understanding that those software programs don't grant you great leeway in terms of adding additional um, language, you may want to think about having a standalone addendum that you can use in your documents, or if you can add these things to them, having them added to your base soft or your base uh, loan documents, just to make sure that you have um, protection from them. Um, first thing that we're going to talk about is uh, financial information and the right to inspect books. You know. Um, Oftentimes in your loans, the financial status of the borrower is going to be a, an important element to whether or not the bank agrees to make the loan or not. And obviously, people's financial situations can change over time. Um, so you're going to want to have the right um, or really the obligation for the borrower to provide them to you, but the right to uh, review the financial uh, uh, statements of the borrower to determine their financial wherewithal. Because if that materially changes, it may affect the borrower's ability to repay, which obviously is going to have a great impact on the bank's ability to collect. Um, so, in order to in order to ensure that the bank has those rights, you want to build those rights into um, the uh, the the loan documents. Um, and 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 if you can, the best practice is to have it as a requirement for the borrower to provide those to you quarterly or annually um, or upon call from the bank, 
uh, depending on how comfortable you are with your borrower um, and how likely you think it may be that they um, may have a, a changing financial uh, position. Uh, this next slide is going to give you some, some sample language that you can include in your loan documents. Uh, it isn't magic language necessarily that uh, you have to have, but um, it, it's there for your uh, for your uh, use. Uh, the next topic, or not the next topic, the next item is the right to inspect collateral. Um, similar to the financial uh, status of the borrower, if you're getting collateral from, and, and, and I really what I'm thinking about here is mostly livestock or grain or anything like that, um, if you if you are getting what you think to be a thousand cows, and um, you know time goes on, uh, if you're not checking the collateral, if you don't have the right to check the collateral, you run into problems where um, potentially your your what you are relying on to secure your loan may be um, being lost to you know either being sold or degradation of quality. Um, or you know any other number of items that if you don't have the right to inspect that collateral, and, and really this is, this goes beyond just relying on the statements from your borrower, but the right to actually physically go on to the property of your borrower so that you can inspect. You know, uh, if you think you're getting a thousand cow or a thousand head of cattle, uh, you want the ability to go out there and you know count them, make sure that there are still a thousand, or that you know that that if you think that you're getting um, certain numbers in terms of uh, um, quality, you know, are they being fed? Uh, is there, are, are their living conditions good? These are all things that you want the ability to um, go out and see for yourselves to make sure that you're, you're adequately protected. Um, and again, this is some sample language that you can use, that you can include in your loan documents um, that will give you those rights because um, <clears throat> there isn't anything worse than thinking that you have collateral only to find out afterwards that either it's been sold off or it's uh, degraded so badly to the point of being uh, worthless. You know, uh, if, if it's grain, is the, is the grain being stored correctly? Is it dry? You know, is there spoilage? What, what's, the, um, what's the condition of it? These, these are all things that as your loan progresses through its life that if you're relying on that collateral to secure your loan, um, that it's that it's there and that it's available to you. And so having the right to inspect that is going to be essential to you. Uh, the next item um, that's something you may want to consider putting into your agreement is the right to appoint a receiver. Now, uh, what a receiver is going to do for you is they're going to be able to take over control of the operation and uh, basically uh, take control of all those assets that uh, you're relying on as your collateral and uh, um, make sure that the borrower then can't sell the rest of them or allow them to degrade or you know get rid of them or retitle them. Um, the receiver will have those powers to take over control. Now there's gonna be an added cost for that receiver, but depending on your particular situation, you may determine that that, uh, that cost is, is worth it. Um, and again, here is some sample language for you. Um, that you can use to uh, that you can use to uh, to uh, put into your loan documents to give you those rights. Um, that's all the specific items that I have. Um, you know, as you as you go through and have new loans come through, these are provisions that you can put into your agreements and make sure that uh, you're protected from a lending standpoint. If you don't have these in your existing loans or you have entered into new loans recently that don't include these terms, but uh, you want to make sure that you have them in there, one time that uh, you can use to uh, add them in there is at, a, at the time that you um, have a default from your lender and you start going through a workout or start going through a forbearance. Um, that'll be a good opportunity for you to add these type of provisions into your loan documents, uh, which uh, is probably a good segue for Ben, who is going to be able to talk to you now about forbearance and uh, about um, uh, workout situation. So with that, I'll pass you on to Ben. All right, good afternoon, guys. 
Uh, again, I'm Ben Bruner, and I'll be talking about agricultural loan modifications, uh, worked out considerations, and alternatives to judicial foreclosure. And obviously, with the increased stress in the agricultural segment, hopefully this information will allow you to, I think, timely, uh, properly, and efficiently respond in situations where you have non-performing yet still cooperative borrowers. Um, so once you've truly identified a stressed agricultural credit, it truly is important to address it ASAP. So you need to analyze the file, you need to examine the options, and then ultimately come up with a plan. Um, a particular situation may merely call for a modification, as Jeff kind of alluded to, um, or maybe a forbearance agreement to give the borrower some, some short-term relief to get through what may or may not be just a temporary rough period. Um, but once you've reached a point, though, where collection and enforcement uh, against the collateral is necessary, I've identified some non-judicial alternative procedures that can save a lot of time and money, especially in the agricultural setting when you're dealing with certain statutory uh, mandatory mediation, one-year right of redemption, and then rights of repurchase upon the ultimate sale of the property once you have it back. So analyzing the loan file, <clears throat> the first step before considering any real modification, forbearance, workout, and like, you or your legal counsel should probably make sure to review and analyze the file and attempt to identify any inconsistencies, any missing information, um, or other potential enforceability issues. Jeff alluded to some of those um, on the front end as far as the documentation um, area, but then this is an opportunity, like you said, to kind of button up some, some previous mistakes or add to the documentation there. So if there are issues identified, you know, this is truly the point when you have a cooperative borrower that's willing to uh, not do as you say, but he, he's willing to ultimately adjust the arrangement. That's where you can, again, button up these issues on the back end. So I'll just briefly touch on these items because Jeff went through it previously, but Proper parties and signatures, obviously you want to confirm that the proper parties are named and have signed all the appropriate documentation. Proper notarizations, so defective notaries are another item that can be kind of an issue and that's, that's truly because some minor yet fatal issues in the notary can allow a bankruptcy trustee uh, to seek to avoid certain mortgages using their strong arm authority. Legal description errors, again Jeff talked about, but it's best to button up any known or maybe originally unknown errors in the legal description at this point in time as compared to trying to reform that mortgage in any real piece of litigation. Default notices. So where agricultural real estate is involved, you need to send 45-day uh, right to cure notices, which that runs in concert with the 45-day mandatory mediation period. I'm guessing Molly Pulaski may have touched on those items earlier. So I, again, just make you generally aware at this point. Inconsistencies between the note and mortgage. So you want to verify that the mortgage terms clearly secure the particular indebtedness, especially a lot of times you're dealing with replacement or alternative notes. Um, loan history. So you want to make sure you're comfortable with the note history, the accounting of the payments received, interest rates, etc. So minor errors with those items um, ultimately on the back end can prevent summary judgment. And thus, again, it's best to fix them as part of any real workout. Lender liability claims. So you need to examine any potential lender liability claims, which those typically come in the form of oral promises to lend additional funds or a promise not to foreclose. So again, it's important to sit down with any loan officers that have been on the file and make sure you're aware of any and all oral or, or written promises that have been made to the borrower. Collateral value concerns. Uh, you should analyze the value of the collateral, obviously, in relation to uh, what the outstanding indebtedness is. Whether the loan is upside down or whether there's equity in the collateral will have a direct bearing on whether you need or want to pursue guarantors, deficiency judgments, et cetera. And similarly, you should evaluate the financial position of the borrower or I suppose guarantor as well, which may dictate the, uh, the form of workout you pursue at that point as well. So moving on to loan and mortgage modifications. So oftentimes, the first request from stressed agricultural borrowers is for a simple modification, uh, which essentially gives them more favorable terms 
um, as far as repaying it. This can be an effective tool um, when you're dealing with highly commodities or highly variable commodity prices, um, and it gives the lender a chance to get repaid in full, um, assuming the borrower can regain his or her financial footing, which a lot of times is a big if. So formal modification of mortgages is essentially required where there's an extension of the maturity date or where the secured obligation has increased. Due to certain statute limitation considerations that affect enforceability of mortgages, uh, whenever the maturity date is extended, the recorded mortgage should also be amended to update that information. And this is because Iowa Code essentially provides that mortgages are unenforceable 10 years after the maturity date if the maturity date is stated in the mortgage. And additionally, if the maturity date is not included in the mortgage, then the mortgage is unenforceable 20 years from the date of the mortgage. So again, where there's an amendment to the maturity date, you need to amend the mortgage. Uh, as lenders, you also want to formally amend any mortgage if the secured amount is increased uh, over and above the originally stated amount. So this is typically done to take advantage of the future advances priority, which is given under the Iowa Code, which affords priority to future advances up to the stated amount of the mortgage. Um, so obviously, if the amount increases, you'll want to amend the mortgage to reflect that to take advantage of that, that future advances priority. There is specific language provided for in the Iowa Code, I believe it's 654.12a, um, that needs to be included in the mortgage to take advantage of that. So if you don't have that, certainly let us know and, and we can shoot it to you. So let's, let's look quickly at some potential priority issues. So the general rule is that a senior lender doesn't lose priority um, if it modifies a mortgage, except to the extent that it materially prejudices, prejudices, prejudices junior lien holders. Um, and typically the penalty for that is loss of priority. So not surprisingly, um, whether or not you're prejudiced depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. But clearly it's been acknowledged that increases in interest rates, increases in the amount of debt, and a reduction in the repayment period are considered prejudicial. Uh, so for example, if the interest rate on the existing mortgage is increased from 5 to 10%, that additional 5% interest may not have priority over recorded liens that are recorded after the original mortgage, uh, but prior, prior to any modification. So alternatively, decreases in the interest rate, reduction in the total loan amount, or an extension of the repayment period typically benefit those junior lien holders. So you aren't going to run into any uh, priority issues there for those types of amendments. Um, in an effort to avoid the materially prejudicial modifications, there is language that you should include in your documentation that expressly allows you the right to modify um, and can again help to overcome loss of priority even in those scenarios. So I have some specific recommended language that isn't currently in most, uh, I guess, bank form mortgages that I typically like to include. So again, feel free to reach out to us if you'd like uh, some examples of that language or that language specifically. And then quickly, when is a guarantor's consent required or recommended when you're modifying a note or mortgage? So consent typically is not necessary since most guarantees are continuing and cover extensions or modifications. However, a guarantor has still been discharged in situations where essentially they deem the modification a substituted contract or if it imposes a fundamentally different risk um, than what the guarantor took on. Initially. So therefore, kind of in abundance of caution, to avoid any such risk, it's generally our recommendation that good practice would just have you have the guarantor also consent to any modification to the loan. <clears throat> so moving on quickly to forbearance agreements. So the basic concept of a forbearance agreement is that the lender agrees to forbear from exercising its remedies provided that one, no further default occurs, and two, that during the forbearance period, the borrower takes certain steps to address the, the loan repayment or collateral concerns. The forbearance agreement is typically a strong indication that the future of the particular cred credit is limited, um, at least in its current form. So it allows some sort of adjustment there to hopefully get on a plane where everybody can uh, make good on the promises and ultimately the bank can get repaid. 
in my experience, um, many forbearance agreements are negotiated over the course of weeks, maybe even months, um, but a lot of times you never actually get entered into. So what I typically recommend, and I know this can be tough, but I typically recommend that lenders should consider sending the required 45-day notice, scheduling the mandatory mediation, and ultimately filing the collection action. Um, that action can always be dismissed if a, if a forbearance or workouts um, agreed to, but if it's not, then ultimately you haven't lost any time moving forward. Um, again, I realize that can be tough, especially from a client relationship standpoint, to move forward so quickly as far as litigation um, or the prerequisites, especially when you got these long-time agricultural borrowers. But again, I think with proper communication, it's typically the best um, and most prudent move. So we'll look quickly at some, some key and recommended provisions for these forbearance agreements. Okay. Uh, first, an acknowledgement of the validity of the loan documents. You should insist that the borrower expressly acknowledge the validity of the loan documents. Um, this kind of serves to remove enforceability claims later on. An acknowledgement of default. So should litigation commence, you don't want to argue over the existence of the default. Thus, you should typically require that the borrower admit the specific nature of the default and also acknowledge that all statutory or contractual notices have been provided or otherwise waived. The amount of the indebtedness, so you should also include there and have the, the borrower confirm the amount of the indebtedness at the time of the forbearance agreement. Again, you don't want to argue about that after the fact as to what is owed and when. The waiver or release of claims, so one of the key benefits, um, a lot of times critical components of the forbearance agreement, is that the lender obtains or should obtain uh, the borrower's release from prior of prior claims against the lender. It kind of puts the borrower in a critical position where if he thinks he has legitimate claims against the, the lender, ultimately he needs to decide whether he wants to pursue those claims, reserve those claims, or move forward with the forbearance agreement and get the additional time. Forbearance period, obviously, each forbearance agreement provides for a specific amount of time for the borrower to essentially implement their, their given strategy. That could be 60 days, six months, um, a lot of times, maybe even up to a year in these agricultural settings. So in addition to kind of those primary provisions, uh, there are also some recommended provisions. Forbearance fee, your attorney's cost is a whole heck of a lot. Um, so a lot of times, lenders will charge a forbearance fee to cover those out-of-pocket expenses. A bankruptcy provision. So a covenant not to file bankruptcy is enforceable against public policy. Um, but what I typically do, I include a provision that makes it clear that the forbearance agreement is effectively void in the event the borrower files bankruptcy and the payments are set aside. Certain covenants of the borrower, so you should capture the borrower's promises to execute their, their preferred or requested strategy. So again, they may covenant to, to list certain collateral for sale. Um, other promises include turning over documents, paying off other claims against real estate or collateral, or otherwise maybe directing rent payments directly to the lender. Um, remedies, so the agreement should also make clear that the lender has the availability of all remedies as set out in the loan documentation, and then specifically in the forbearance agreement, you can also come up with some unique or unusual remedies potentially, which may involve maybe placing a confession of judgment in escrow. So that covers for the most part forbearance agreements. I'm going to talk now just quickly short sales. Let's see how we do for time. So short sales, they're fairly straightforward for lenders. Um, its primary role is providing the closing agent with payoff statement. Which you're agreeing to take less than essentially what you're owed. So it's a reduced payoff in exchange for the release of the mortgage on the property. So for loans secured by real estate strictly, a short sale typically accompanies a debt settlement agreement, which sets forth the full agreement of the parties. So for example, even though the lender has agreed to take less than what is owed, um, that debt settlement agreement may reserve a deficiency, and that deficiency 
typically we see takes the form of an unsecured deficiency note. Um, and that debt settlement agreement is also a useful tool. Uh, you can include a lot of the standard provisions we talked about earlier with forbearance agreements. Uh, but essentially, instead of providing the framework for relationship moving forward, the short sale, in essence, provides an opportunity to, to truly settle and end the relationship. The voluntary non-judicial foreclosure process, and that is found in Iowa Code Section 654-18. So unlike the traditional judicial foreclosure, the primary benefit of the voluntary procedure is that it removes all junior liens and obtains marketable title in approximately 30 days. Um, the only real drawback is that the lenders must waive their right to pursue the mortgage or borrower for any deficiency. So if a deficiency is desired, uh, the deed and move process is typically the recommended route. And we'll touch on that after this. So with agricultural land, um, the mortgagor is typically entitled, as I alluded to earlier, the right to first refusal and repurchase under Iowa Code Section 654. Thus, again, this agreement um, sh should include specific provisions of waiving um, those rights. And the written agreement, which we'll talk a little bit in, in more detail here, essentially provides an opportunity for the parties to again include provisions commonly found in those settlement or workout agreements, which, as we talked about, may be release of claims, assignment of, of rent payments, etc. So moving on to, I'll call them the structural requirements for voluntary non-judicial foreclosure. So the statute requires the parties to file what they call a jointly executed agreement and you file that in the county where the real estate is located. And that agreement expressly states that the parties had elected the non-judicial voluntary procedure under the Iowa Code. It also includes a written notice um, and disclosure wherein the borrower has a right to cancel uh, the process. And they have that right to cancel for five days after delivery of that notice. But if it's not canceled, then, then Essentially, the foreclosure becomes final, subject only to the 30-day right of redemption for junior lien holders. <clears throat> so along with that written agreement, and contemporaneously with the filing of that agreement, the borrower conveys to the lender um, their interest in the real estate that's subject to mortgage. Uh, the statute doesn't dictate the nature of that conveyance, but we typically see and want um, a special warranty deed there. But even though the deed is filed and the agreement's filed, the completion uh, of the non-judicial foreclosure is again contingent upon that expiration of the 30-day right of redemption period for junior lien holders. So getting to that, once the parties have entered into that foreclosure agreement, they have the deed, then the lender provides notice to all the junior lien holders of the election of the non-judicial process. And that notice essentially informs those junior lien holders uh, that parties have agreed to foreclose the mortgage under the voluntary process, and that each junior lien holder has 30 days from the mailing of that notice to exercise any right of redemption. If they don't uh, timely redeem, essentially their lien is extinguished and removed from the property. So to kind of bookend that, to complete that foreclosure then, the lender generally files an affidavit attaching copies of the notice to the junior lien holders, um, stating that no party exercised its right to redeem, and also stating that the borrower did not exercise its right to cancel the foreclosure agreement within that five-day period. And that's essentially your 30-day voluntary non-judicial process. I think we've got a few more minutes. Dean Lowe foreclosure, um, I alluded to it a little bit earlier. It essentially allows the lender to take immediate title to the property. Um, the drawback is it doesn't eliminate or deal with any junior lien holders um, or liens that may encumber the real estate. So again, if junior liens exist, you'll want to consider the voluntary non-judicial procedure, which can scrape those off. With the deed in lieu, there's no requirement for notices of right to cure or mediation prior to accepting that deed in lieu. Um, and in contrast to the voluntary non-judicial process, the deed in lieu procedure does allow the lender to accept a deed and still pursue a deficiency if the parties so agree. So a 
lot of times people think, oh, we just need a deed in lieu for the property to come back to us. You're also going to want a written agreement with that as well. And that'll spell out, again, if you want to retain a deficiency. Um, but more, I guess, appropriately, it also waives the borrower's rights of purchase, rights of first refusal, et cetera, that, that kind of tag along with agricultural loans. So it's, it's more than just a deed. You'll want another written agreement setting forth the agreement of, of the party. So there is little, I guess, language that we require um, in all deeds in lieu. So first, in Iowa, essentially, where the mortgage or deeds the property back to the lender, the general rule is that deed is presumed to be a, a continuation of the security, and thus the right of redemption continues. So that presumption can be overcome if the deed explicitly states that the conveyance is absolute, for valuable consideration and not given as additional security. So that language should be specifically included in the deed form. Additionally, uh, the deed should also include a statement that the mortgagor believes the value of the real estate is less than or equal to the amount of the indebtedness being released. And this is because essentially if the mortgagee transfers equity in the property, um, there, there isn't reasonably equivalent value so if the mortgagee then files for bankruptcy after the fact, the bankruptcy court may seek to avoid that transfer as a fraudulent conveyance. So again, that's important language to include in that deed in lieu as well. So I think we're running out of time, but that was just, again, kind of a brief description of the non-judicial uh, options when you have a cooperative non-performing borrower. Um, and hopefully that gives you, again, just some helpful information in dealing with those, those stress loans. And you can feel free to contact us with any questions. Uh, thanks, Ben. And uh, if what Jeff has advised you to put in your agreements uh, hasn't solved your problem, and if Ben's non-judicial options haven't solved your problems, you end up talking to somebody like me. Uh, I am a commercial litigator here at the Dickinson Law Firm. Uh, I do. Uh, collateral enforcement actions, foreclosures, as well as uh, some practice in bankruptcy, uh, and have some experience in Chapter 12 bankruptcy as well, which is particularly relevant here. I want to talk about uh, an issue that I've seen crop up several times when dealing with distressed agricultural borrowers, uh, and that is uh, a distressed borrower comes in and says, I know uh, my operation hasn't been cash flowing, and uh, I've got concerns about my profitability coming forward or going forward here. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch to organic farming. And the reason I'm going to do that is because I'm going to pretty much double my uh, price for grain. Uh, I've given you kind of a, a summary here of the recent uh, price of conventional uh, commodities such as corn and soybeans compared to some uh, organic prices. And you can see uh, that they're almost twice as much in some cases, if not more, than what the conventional crop is worth. And so a lot of uh, producers will look at that and say, well, here's the answer. Uh, I'll just switch my operation over to organic and that'll solve all of my cash flow problems. Uh, and we'll be on easy street from here on out. It may not surprise you to learn that it is not quite that easy. Uh, in 2002, the USDA came out with a comprehensive set of regulations that uh, spell out what is necessary in order for your operation to be able to sell certified organic uh, commodities. And certified organic is where the money's at because that's what allows the people that purchase those commodities to then turn around and market their products as being certified organic as well. Uh, the USDA has kind of set out a five-step process uh, that you can find uh, on their website, and I've just kind of grabbed it and put it on this slide. It's simple to write, uh, terribly complicated in its execution. Uh, there are a number of requirements that have to be fall followed, probably the most significant of which is the operation has to be certified by a certified organic certifying agent. And there's a number of entities that are qualified uh, in and around the state of Iowa to do that. 
uh, but this isn't just some rubber stamp kind of operation. Uh, these certifiers have to come out and work closely with the producer to ensure that they sh successfully shift their operation over uh, to organic. One of the other problems or uh, challenges, I should say, with switching to an organic operation is that even though your prices may increase uh, substantially, uh, your yield is going to go down. Uh, there's research from the USDA that shows about a 25% reduction in total commodity yields um, across all uh, or across three of the major commodities there. Uh, obviously, that'll vary by producer and by operation. Uh, I've certainly seen evidence uh, presented of situations where organic operations were able to achieve yields much closer to what you would get from a conventional operation. Uh, but that's not going to be true for everybody, and it depends a lot on the operator and also on the characteristics of their operation. And to be honest, the initial yields are probably going to be a lot lower in the first couple of years after an organic switch uh, as the operator fine-tunes their organic operation. There are a number of compliance issues that I think producers uh, may not be aware of when they first come across the idea of switching their operation to organic. Uh, the first and most significant, of course, is that they have to let their ground lay fallow for three years. I say fallow, it doesn't really have to be fallow. Um, you know, there could be alternatives, uh, uh, alternative crops grown in that interim period. But what, what, what they cannot do is grow conventional crops on the ground that they plan to use for organic crops because the ground has to be free of prohibited substances, which means it has to be free of all of your standard herbicides, pesticides, fertilizer, uh, and as well as GMO seeds. Uh, USDA has some recommendations for what the operator should do to try to cash flow during that interim period. They could certainly plant uh, organic qualifying crops uh, and treat the operation as organic during that three-year period, but they're not going to be able to get that organic certification. So they're only going to be able to sell their crops for conventional prices. And as you already saw, the yields during that time period are going to be lower, so it may compound cash flow problems that they're already experiencing. One of the things the USDA emphasize, emphasizes when operators are looking to transition their operation is they have to kind of rethink their uh, approach to farming. Uh, a lot of operators approach organic farming with an input substitution mindset where they think that they can just go to the list of approved uh, herbicide products and pesticide products and just substitute one of the approved products for the product that they typically use. Uh, and then substitute uh, compliant seeds uh, with the GMO uh, seeds that they typically plant. And USDA guidance is very clear that that's probably not going to work. Uh, instead, the operator has to combine cultural, biological, and mechanical practices to try to achieve the same results that they are currently getting with modern fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides. Uh, one of the, the more vexing problems for a lot of these operations is figuring out what to do about pests, including uh, insects as well as invasive weeds. Uh, a lot of the products that are permitted to be sprayed don't have the same impact uh, as a, a conventional pesticide or herbicide, and so they're going to have to combine a number of practices, including planting uh, other crops that are designed to attract insect predators, uh, in amongst their existing operation or their, their existing crops. But of course, then that's going to add competition to the organic crops, which will then decrease their ability to grow uh, and produce a yield. So from my experience in litigating uh, organic transition plans and bankruptcy, uh, one of the points that all the experts have made is that it takes an operator a couple of years to really fine tune that operation into one that's achieving yields that are, um, con, you know, sort of the best possible uh, while remaining consistent with organic practices. One of the things that I think surprises many operators uh, is that not all manure is equal. Uh, there are actually strict limits on manure fertilizer in the organic uh, certification regulations. And 
generally speaking, manure uh, can come from animals that have been fed uh, conventional crops. And so just because uh, livestock are consuming conventional corn uh, does not mean that the operator is prohibited from using that manure on the field. However, there are certain uh, sources of manure that may contain levels of pesticides or other prohibited substances that exceed the limits in the organic uh, regulations. And so the certifying entity that actually comes and certifies the operation may want to identify that manure source and actually test the manure to make sure that it complies with the USDA regulations. Again, a lot of what I've seen uh, when I was litigating one of these cases recently is the operator gets up on the witness stand and I'm cross-examining him and he makes a statement, well, all manure is manure and I don't need to have a plan as to where my manure is going to come from because we'll just get it from my, uh, my hog house here on the property. And while it is entirely possible that manure uh, would be sufficient and would comply, uh, nevertheless, it would probably need to be tested and there was no way that operator could tell me sitting on the witness stand right then that his manure uh, was going to be compliant with USDA regulations. Uh, there's also limitations on how uh, soon or how proximate to harvest you can apply your fertilizer unless you engage in some kind of composting. Uh, as I mentioned, GMO seeds are also prohibited. Uh, one of the one of the challenges that an operator has during the transition period is ensuring that they have put together uh, an organic system plan that identifies all the ways in which they're going to ensure their operation complies with the organic regulations. Uh, one of the issues in that organic system plan will be identifying a source for their seeds uh, to ensure that they have the appropriate characteristics, but to also ensure they don't have any banned substances, such as any substance applied to the outer coating of the seed uh, that's designed to reduce fungus or some other uh, some other kind of desirable coating. Uh, conventional seeds can be used, again, as long as they're uh, not GMO. Uh, one of the problems that an operator might face is if they're only transitioning part of their operation to organic, so they'll have part conventional, part organic, is making sure that they don't accidentally cross-contaminate the organic section of their operation with conventional seeds. So that means cleaning out the planter uh, before they go and plant their organic seeds or planting organic first and then doing conventional after the fact. Uh, the regulations also make clear that uh, the operator needs to uh, pay attention to waterways that might flow through an organic field from a conventional field uh, those waterways obviously can transport bands and prohibited substances, which could cause the operator to lose that organic certification. And of course, if that happens, then that operator is going to lose all of the benefits uh, that come with an organic certification, uh, namely the price boost that they see. Uh, some of the other issues that you may want to keep in mind when you're talking to an operator about uh, who's considering switching to organic uh, particularly a distressed operator, is that uh, if there are other creditors that have an interest in that particular operation, they're going to closely scrutinize a new venture like switching to organic farming. And there's actually some law up in the Northern District of Iowa, Bankruptcy Court, which is just about everything north of Interstate 80, uh, where the Bankruptcy Court up there took a close look at uh, uh, a debtor's proposal to significantly and substantially change their operation. Uh, the case was called Plymouth Oil, and it didn't involve a farm. Uh, it involved a uh, food processing company, but the lessons from that case are very uh, instructive for a situation where you've got a farmer who's looking to change to organic farming. What the bankruptcy judge up in the Northern District said is uh, a operation's past performance is the best evidence we have of what their future performance is likely to be. And particularly in bankruptcy, if a farmer files a, a Chapter 12 bankruptcy where they're looking to reorganize their operation uh, and then come out of bankruptcy and continue to operate, the court is looking for what will be different. Uh, if a farmer goes into Chapter 12 and essentially says, look, 
Uh, I don't really need to change my operation. I'm just going to keep going the way I've been going. Bankruptcy court is going to say, no, I'm sorry, your past performance uh, does not indicate that that's going to work for you. But at the same time, if the, op if the farmer comes into Chapter 12 and says, look, it hasn't been working using conventional crops, but I'm going to switch to organic and then it's all going to work. The court's going to look closely at the past performance and say, well, why do you think uh, after failing at conventional farming, you're going to be able to make that switch to organic? And particularly where there's no track record um, of doing any kind of organic farming, the court is less likely to approve a plan where a uh, farmer is going to change their operation over to organic. And what is more likely is the court is either going to dismiss the bankruptcy or switch it over into a Chapter 7 liquidation. And I mentioned other creditors a few minutes ago because you as a primary lender may decide after looking closely at the operation that you think this particular operator can do it. They, they've had some you know, unique situations that cause them to experience extreme cash flow difficulty, but you think that those can be explained and that you're ready to partner with this operator and uh, take the risk on a transition to an organic operation. Other creditors may not be willing to do so, particularly junior creditors uh, who may have junior liens on the land. Uh, they may come into a bankruptcy where you and the operator have said, judge, please approve this plan for reorganization. We, we really think that this is going to work, so let us out of bankruptcy and, and we're going to make a go of this. Those junior creditors have the ability to step in and, and put a halt to that. Uh, and what they're going to rely upon is the case that I'm talking about right here, which is the case that says if you're going to substantially change the nature of the operation into a business that that particular debtor has no background or experience in, we're really going to scrutinize that uh, as a court and be less likely to approve of that plan uh, than some others that the debtor may have uh, background or experience in. So when it comes to organic farming, it's important to keep in mind uh, that you really need to get involved with the operation. Uh, I've seen the, the bankruptcy cases I've handled and and every bankruptcy case I've handled involving a, a farmer has involved the farmer coming to the court and saying, I'm going to switch to organic farming. Uh, you need to closely scrutinize that plan because in every case that I've encountered, the operator hasn't really looked at it very closely as far as what is required and instead has been fixated on the price difference that they're going to enjoy if they're able to get that organic certification. So if you're in the stage of negotiating a forbearance agreement, uh, or some other kind of loan modification agreement. And the reason you're doing that is because you think the operator is going to be able to change to organic. Uh, you need to have a, a hard conversation with the operator. And as Ben suggested, you may want to include a number of those uh, requirements for the organic certification in your loan documentation so you can ensure that uh, if the operator doesn't meet those requirements, that you have the ability to proceed then uh, to enforce your rights against the collateral. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, bankruptcy, foreclosure, uh, any of the loan document modification issues we've talked about, uh, please feel free to email Ben, Jeff, or me, and we'll be happy to get back to you. All right. <clears throat> that concludes our webinar. Thanks, everybody, for attending, and thanks to Jeff and John and Ben for this great information. We do have some questions, but since it is one o'clock and we're up against the time limit, we will be answering those. Um, we'll be sending out answers uh, here shortly this afternoon. Um, and with that, uh, unless Ben, do you want to answer this question right now, or you know, I can take a stab at it? Yeah. So it, essentially, upon a divorce, that divorce, whether it's a stipulated settlement or a, an order by the by the court. It can transfer the property, um, but ultimately any transfer of the property to a, a now spouse, soon to be ex-spouse, um, that would be subject to, to the existing mortgage. So you wouldn't lose priority. The loan would still be enforceable. There wouldn't be any priority issues with the mortgage. Essentially, they'd take subject to it. But a divorce decree or settlement can transfer property. So the handouts are available, both session one and session two, for download. Um, on your interface screen, you can uh, click on those and download them. And if you have any questions 
um, please feel free to reach out to our attorneys. Their information is there for you as well. Thank you, everybody, and we hope you have a good day.